In 2016, the world of gaming was shaken to its core. You see, in 2016, a little-known, tiny, previously unsuccessful indie gaming company called Blizzard released a game called Overwatch. It went pretty under the radar. I hear maybe there's a second one now. All jokes aside, the release of Overwatch was a huge moment in gaming. The 6v6 shooter became an instant hit for its vibrant colors, beautiful maps, deep lore, and amazing character designs. In a blog post, Blizzard itself writes that, quote, The characters of Overwatch were more than just their classes. They would have backstories and names, identities inextricably tied to the rich world they inhabited. They would be heroes. Every character is unique and distinct, from grizzled veteran Soldier 76 to mad genius hamster wrecking ball to sexy Dr. Mercy. Hold on, what? Mercy, also known by her civilian name Dr. Angela Ziegler, is a support character with a focus on healing her allies and boosting their damage. Her angel-inspired design emphasizes light, purity, and her conventionally attractive figure. Blizzard really, really likes to emphasize her figure. Mercy is a healer, an angel first, and a genius doctor second. I mean, really, does it matter that Angela Ziegler pioneered nanotechnology and is a highly respected doctor when you stick her in the Mercy suit and her feats of scientific mastery are intentionally portrayed as acts of magic? Now, let me establish that I love Mercy. I have hours played on her and own most of her legendary skins. I love this character, and it's because I've spent so much time with her that I've started to notice, well, the weird, hypersexualized, and sometimes even sexist dimensions of her character. In this video, we will delve into Mercy's character design, gameplay, lore, and finally treatment by the Overwatch community to examine all Mercy's conflicting characterizations and the sexism and feminism baked into these various representations. While it may seem trivial to go so in-depth about one character from one game, representation affects our lives, and I believe some aspects of Mercy reinforce negative stereotypes about both women in STEM and women overall, and it is vital we examine these tropes and why they came about. Mercy's design is, to put it simply, very sexualized. Her outfit focuses on emphasizing her curvaceous figure, Notice how the fabric on her hips gives her the silhouette of having an even curvier figure without needing to add to her waist? Indeed, in the official story of Valkyrie, it is specified the Mercy suit molds to her, which emphasizes her large chest. Her Overwatch 2 design furthers this by adding gold bands on her chest to draw the eye to the area. In all honesty, I doubt the Valkyrie suit has enough support to be running and flying with any semblance of comfort. And you know you have to be comfortable when you're desperately trying to heal your team's Reinhardt because he decided to charge straight into the enemy team's back line. The impracticality of Mercy's design is furthered by the fact that she wears heels, heels, in life or death battle scenarios. And not even little wedges or platform shoes. She wears full on several inch high heels. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Being a genius doctor can't save you from twisting an ankle because you were an idiot who wore heels into battle. Richard Thompson Ford, a Stanford law professor, reports in his book Dress Codes that, quote, high heels belong exclusively to the female sex and so demonstrate adherence to gender conventions of female propriety. Essentially, Mercy's high-heeled shoes help make this character with a non-traditionally feminine interest, biology, more palatable because it re-feminizes her. And obviously that's the most important thing when you're fighting robo-terrorists. The severe impracticality of high heels hobbles women at best and reduces them to decorative objects at worst. Women should wear shoes that make them happy, but it's telling that the mostly male character designers for Overwatch chose to put Mercy in impractical and objectifying shoes. High heels and suggestive design aren't the only parts of Mercy's design worth scrutinizing. Her pale blonde hair and its connections to both purity and intellect are also important to analyze given her angel theme. Mercy has short, but not too short, blonde hair, which is usually styled with a large tuft of loose hair and some kind of ponytail or bob. Back to our beloved dress codes, Thompson Ford writes that, quote, The blonde has long held a distinctive place in the sexual imaginations of Americans, from sweet girls next door in Hollywood films to unattainable bombshells like Marilyn Monroe. He continues that there are few naturally platinum blonde people. To describe bleached blonde hair, we refer only to other bleached blonde hair, he writes meaning that pale blonde hair for women is perceived as stylish and sexual, but also vain due to the intense labor involved. Combined with the fact that fashion magazine Allure calls the blonde bombshell a fantasy made by men for men, 
it is clear that Mercy's hair color serves as a signifier of beauty and feminine vanity to counterbalance her less traditionally feminine hairstyle so she remains attractive to men. However, a stereotype Ford Thompson fails to mention, and the stereotype that may be most vital to us today, is the dumb blonde. The dumb blonde trope is the idea that women with blonde hair, especially pale blonde hair, are inherently less intelligent than other women. This trope is epitomized by women such as Karen from the 2004 film Mean Girls and Birdie J from 2022's Glass Onion. Birdie literally thinks a sweatshop is a place where sweatpants are made. While this is a trope that has undermined more and more in recent media, the idea itself remains powerful. In May of 2020, Refinery29 published an article discussing how the trope continues to harm women, with women interviewed for the piece talking about sexist jokes aimed at them throughout their lives, and even one woman who was explicitly told, well, you don't look clever, by a male colleague. The article concludes that the dumb blonde is, quote, just another stereotype in a long line of misogynist lies that aim to silence and humiliate women. In short, this trope is wielded to diminish women's intelligence so they are less threatening to men. By this standard, Mercy's pale blonde hair almost serves to undermine her intelligence, making her appear less threatening to viewers who do not match her achievements. And now, saving the easiest bit of analysis for last, let's talk about Mercy's wings, halo, and general angel symbolism. The angelic aspects of Mercy's design are perhaps the character's defining trait, and they also contribute to her sexualization and diminishing of her intelligence. Designing Mercy as an angel makes her scientific advancements seem more like miracles than actual discoveries she worked for, which undermines her genius into something fantastic and whimsical. Minor things in her design, such as the light that emanates from her wings when she glides and the glowing effect of her resurrectability, only enhance the idea that Mercy's healing is a magical ability, and not the result of painstaking research on her part. While there are characters with legitimately magical abilities in Overwatch, Hanzo literally shoots dragons at at his enemies, it's notable that one of the smartest characters in the Overwatch universe is visually designed more like these magic users than her fellow techie heroes. Even Mercy's main scientific rival, fellow female scientist Moira Dorian, has her background in biotechnology much more explicitly emphasized in her design, with her Overwatch 2 redesign having very deliberate mad scientist inspiration that clearly communicates evil scientist to the viewer. Perhaps it is because Mercy is intended to be attractive to the average male viewer that her design sexualizes her and undermines her intelligence, or perhaps her beauty for science second design is why she's one of the game's most iconic and popular characters. Either way, Mercy's character design is instrumental in her characterization as Mercy, the saintly hero who will sacrifice anything to save you, the presumably male viewer with her magic powers and bombshell beauty. Mercy is a support hero focused on healing allies and boosting their damage with her main weapon, the Caduceus Staff. Additionally, she can use her left shift ability, Guardian Angel or GA, to fly to allies in her E ability to resurrect a single fallen teammate. She has no armor stat and is eliminated with ease if she has no teammate to fly to. These factors together mean that Mercy is... mm, yeah, she's really weak on her own. Mercy and her companion in the support category, Lifeweaver, are actually the only two characters currently in the game who need to intentionally switch to a different weapon to deal damage. Mercy does have a small handgun, which isn't that useful when a full health Winston jumps directly on top of your back line. I think Mercy's damage boost is an interesting lens through which to analyze the character, since she is the only character in the game who is literally discouraged from dealing damage herself. Now, Mercy is a support character, the category comprised of women, queer-coded men, and a robot, but that's a topic for another video. But basically, every support hero has at least some damage-dealing capacity, and some are even commonly played as damage characters who incidentally heal their allies. However, as previously mentioned, Mercy doesn't get to join the fun, instead using the blue damage boost beam on her allies to boost their damage. In essence, Mercy is only useful when she's helping someone else. When you see that this is her core mechanic, you start to see why her early male design was scrapped. Mercy's emphasis on purely aiding others falls into the sexist trap of expecting women to be silent supporters of their more masculine and hence more competent counterparts. TV Tropes calls this phenomenon the the stay-in-the-kitchen trope, in which women are expected to stay far away from the action in supporting roles. While Mercy obviously doesn't fall too deeply into this trope, she is still in the heat of battle, she is still expected to stay in the backline where she is safe and able to heal about her allies. 
Mercy's gameplay pre presents her as fragile, ethereal, and stereotypically feminine in a way that I believe reinforces negative stereotypes. Mercy's main piece of lore is the short story Valkyrie by Michael Chu, a 26-page book about why she chose to rejoin Overwatch after it ruined her reputation as a young scientist. In this section, I will refer to her as Mercy when she dons the Valkyrie suit and Angela when she does not, just as Chu does in the story. The story opens with Angela reflecting on her parents' deaths during the Omnic Crisis, the robot uprising that kickstarted the game's story, and how everyone she knew from Overwatch has been scattered to the winds after the organization's disastrous dissolution. The scene then shifts as two of her old comrades, Jack Morrison and Anna Amari, show up at her apartment looking for aid. These two living symbols of the past Angela is trying to escape reignites her annoyance with Overwatch and the organization's violent tendencies. This opening scene establishes two traits that are not communicated in her design or in-game voice lines. Angela Ziegler is a peace advocate, and Angela Ziegler has a sharp, occasionally unkind tongue. These six pages alone already give Angela more depth than she's given in 90% of her in-game voice lines, but let's keep going. We next see Angela's first visit with Jack Morrison, then the charismatic leader of Overwatch, where it's established that Angela only joined the paramilitary organization because it offered her the money and personnel she needed to spread her revolutionary nanobiotic healing all over the world. We once again see Mercy's sharp wit that often isn't included in the game. She even admits that her attitude gives people a certain prickly opinion of me. This is often reflected in her in-game interactions, basically the only part of her lore that's actually featured in the game. We'll talk more about Mercy's voice lines later, but she does have some top-tier interactions. The next scene is where Angela's characterization gets truly interesting. She is jolted awake by explosions, and Anna informs her that the terrorist organization talent is attacking the city and implies that people will need Mercy, not Angela's, aid. Angela reluctantly unpacks the Valkyrie suit and reflects that, quote, It all still fit, but I'd forgotten just how heavy the suit was. This is Chu very, very subtly, oh so subtly, telling us that Angela sees her role as Mercy as a burden. Angela later continues, warning for a very long quote ahead, I never wanted to be Mercy. It was something that was thrust upon me. The Valkyrie suit was to prove a point, that my technology worked. But I knew how other people saw me, how my teammates wanted me to shoulder with them. And so, little by little, Dr. Ziegler withdrew and Mercy took her place. Wow. Just wow. This is literally such a fascinating aspect of Angela's character that is never explored outside the story. It's also notable that Angela literally has to constantly endanger herself as a combat medic to prove that she deserves the funding and respect she needs to continue her vital work. You don't see this happening with the game's male scientists, do you? And the mental separation between competent, strong Dr. Ziegler and Mercy? Oh, chef's kiss. So good. Overwatch needs to continue developing its lore in general, but they need to explore Angela more. This is legitimately compelling stuff, if you're willing to acknowledge Mercy's intelligence and existence as more than a sexy heel bot. The story then cuts to a battle scene where Mercy saves two injured children from a collapsing building, which, while well written, doesn't have much for us in terms of analysis. The final scene is Angela at a Cairo hospital reflecting on Mercy's usefulness to save and inspire people, and she realizes her fight is not over. This is an incredibly well-written story, and I highly suggest you check it out if you're interested. Plus, if more people read the Overwatch stories, then we can get more in the future. Please, Blizzard, I'm so desperate for Overwatch lore. Overall, Valkyrie does a great job at establishing Mercy as a complex, intelligent woman, and it's a solid short story overall. However, there's one more aspect of Mercy's character to explore, her in-game voice lines. Overwatch voice lines fall into two varieties, character interactions and gameplay-based interactions. Mercy's character interactions are usually quite solid. These random character interactions, when they occur, make great use of Mercy's wit and present her as an intelligent, competent character. However, her gameplay-based interactions are usually not this. Mercy's in-game voice lines support her and undercut her depending on the context, but unfortunately it seems like her voice lines in the heat of combat, which more people are likely to hear and quote, support her image as a magical loving angel instead of the witty, sarcastic genius we know she is. We've seen how amazing good Mercy content can be. 
Now, let's move on to discuss some less savory interpretations. It's no secret that Overwatch fans make interesting art of basically every female character in the game, from barely adult diva to aging Irish scientist Moira. However, Mercy seems to bear the brunt of the Overwatch fandom's interests, as well as its sexism and vitriol. Due to the fact that I am a minor and deeply uncomfortable with spicy art, I'll leave it to others to analyze why Mercy is so prominently featured in this subgenre of fan art. Just note there's a lot of it. Like, entire deviant art groups about it. While there is overt sexualization of all female Overwatch characters, I believe that Mercy's treatment in the main game contributes to her sexualization by the fandom. When you see a character whose entire purpose is to serve and heal you, when that narrative is drilled in unless you go out of your way to read a 26-page short story to combat it, it's easy to think of Mercy as this objectified thing to be used. The objectification and daintifying of Mercy continues in many fan fictions, where terms like prim and dainty abound. She's also featured heavily in many works marked as explicit. Indeed, as of the writing of this video, almost half of the works of about Mercy on Archive of Our Own is rated explicit or mature. Obviously, some of these works are probably great and do her character justice. I cannot claim to have read every Overwatch fanfiction in existence, and if you have any good PG-13 fanfiction recommendations, please let me know. However, from what I've seen in my own fanfic reading is that Mercy is almost never allowed to be the main character, instead being the beautiful, reassuring backup to fandom favorites like Cassidy and Hanzo that dominate fanfiction. While it saddens me that no one is taking Michael Chu's lead in creating amazing Mercy-centric works, again, I can't blame them for wanting to write about two characters with their own full comics and animated shorts instead. Outside of creative pursuits, Mercy takes the brunt of much of the fandom's annoyance in terms of nerfs and changes. For example, when the sniper Ash was introduced and massively overperformed, it was Mercy's damage boost that took much of the blame, leading to huge nerfs and lasting damage to the character's reputation. This cycle happened again with the introduction of Sojourn. Players noticed she overperformed with a Mercy boosting her damage, and Mercy players now quiver in fear every single patch. Seriously, Mercy has been changed almost every single patch since the release of Overwatch 2. When will Mercy players know peace? We can see the vitriol Mercy faces on the most pleasant site on Earth, Reddit, and even YouTube comments. Mercy players are derided as unskilled, annoying, and because she's popular with female gamers, incompetent. Mercy may violently swing from being the worst support to wildly overpowered, but no other character regularly encounters this level of abuse from fans. Mercy's fan and treatment is overwhelmingly negative, or at least hypersexualized and often ignorant of the fact that she is literally one of the smartest characters in the Overwatch universe. I love Mercy. Maybe you do too, or maybe you don't, but I hope my analysis of her helped you in some way. It may seem trivial to dig so deep into one character from one game, but Blizzard is one of the biggest gaming companies in the world, and what they do sets the tone for much of the industry. Mercy's depiction has bothered me since I was a little kid playing Overwatch 1 on my family's PS4, and if you've gotten this far, I just want to thank you for sticking through to the end. Please feel free to comment below with your own thoughts, your hate comments are great for boosting this video to the YouTube algorithm, and I'll see you in the next video.